Hey guys, in this video, the lovely Tim is going to be taking you through the character of Elizabeth I. This is something you need for your GCSE history. Now, to go with this video, over on my website, there are loads and loads of multiple choice questions to make sure you've remembered all of the key facts that you need. Elizabeth was born on the 7th of September, 1533, towards the end of the reign of Henry VIII who was King of England from 1509 to 1547. Although his reign was shorter than his daughter Elizabeth's, it was nevertheless important and had a huge impact on both the country as a whole and Elizabeth in particular. Elizabeth's mother was Anne Boleyn, the second wife of Henry VIII. Ultimately, Anne Boleyn would be executed at the behest of Henry VIII when Elizabeth was two, only a toddler. Elizabeth was named after her two grandmothers, both of whom were called Elizabeth. The first was Elizabeth of York, the wife of Henry VII and mother of Henry VIII. The second was Elizabeth Howard, mother of her mother, Anne Boleyn. As is common for the Elizabethan age, few reliable likenesses remain. We don't, for example, have a reliable likeness of William Shakespeare. Pictured here, however, is what is known as the Darnley Portrait of around 1575 which is generally considered to be a reasonably good picture of Elizabeth. Being a royal portrait, however, it's likely that some embellishments were made to present a more favourable image in the interests of both Elizabeth and the preservation of the artist. Elizabeth was known, when dissatisfied by a picture being painted of her, to have the artist executed. Nevertheless, this remains almost the standard picture used to represent Elizabeth and seems to be regarded both then and now as relatively accurate and reliable. The Tudor era like some of the eras after it, was an especially brutal and horrific time to be an infant or child. Mortality rates for both mothers in childbirth and infants were high, at least 14% according to contemporary records. Anne Boleyn, Elizabeth's mother, as we've seen, did indeed survive the birth of Elizabeth. Following this, however, about two years, eight months later, she was executed on charges of treason by Henry VIII and beheaded. Elizabeth was, as was common at the time, given a relatively sophisticated education. While educating girls was not normal, her parents would have been aware that it was possible Elizabeth may in the future become queen and should therefore be given at least a basic education. All children at the higher ends of social status at the time were educated by tutors rather than informal schooling. Many of the tutors Elizabeth has as a child were friends and allies in later life, including William Grindle, Kat Ashley and Roger Ascombe. Under these tutors, Elizabeth focused on languages, of which she learned including Latin, French and Spanish. Latin was the language of the day for many people, although gradually Middle English was coming into fruition, so learning Latin would not have been unusual, especially for an individual of her social standing. Through her teenage years, Elizabeth is recorded as having a fondness for translating, a common pursuit for girls of the day. She especially preferred, apparently, the translation of Latin and Greek classics. Of particular note, however, is a book called Prayers and Meditations, a religious work by Elizabeth's godmother, which Elizabeth was, by a relatively young age, able to translate, and a copy of the translation she presented to her father as a New Year's Day gift. Henry VIII's reaction to this is unknown, but he had scant regard for the abilities of women. Upon being born, Elizabeth was instantly heir presumptive to the English throne. She was the oldest child who had not yet been disinherited by Henry VIII, meaning it was presumed by most people that should circumstances not change, for example that she dies or Henry VIII disinherited her, that she would become queen following his death. Her older sister Mary had lost her claim to the throne, being disinherited by King Henry VIII. As Henry VIII had annulled his marriage to Mary's mother in order to remarry, Elizabeth herself would indeed be declared illegitimate when Henry VIII married Jane Seymour. Critically, however, Seymour produced a male child, something Henry VIII greatly desired and the reason why he continued marrying different women. This continued the Tudor lineage and the child was called Edward. The boy immediately on his birth became the undisputed and undisputable heir to the throne and replaced Elizabeth as the heir presumptive to the throne of England. As one may expect, the boy Edward did indeed follow Henry VIII as king. He became Edward VI in 1547. His reign, however, would only last six years, and during the entirety of this reign, Edward was a child, leading to what was and is known as a regency, where a trusted adult rules until the child reaches a mature age, usually 16 or 18. Edward was 
first fully Protestant monarch. This followed Henry VIII's break with the Roman Catholic Church. Upon his death, senior government figures formulated a device for the suction to ensure that England would never again have a Catholic monarch. This seemed to work, as Edward VI was indeed fully Protestant. However, with Edward VI's early death, this would be thwarted. Mary I, pictured here, became queen, and she was firmly Catholic. She immediately made efforts to reverse the Protestant reforms that had taken place across England to turn it into a Protestant rather than a Catholic nation and had taken place under Henry VIII. This led to numerous bloody executions as people were burned alive or executed for their faith. By her death in 1558, however, she had reluctantly accepted that there was no other option than Elizabeth would become queen. She was the heir apparent and had the strongest claim to being the direct descendant of Henry VIII. Elizabeth therefore became queen at a relatively young age of 25. She swiftly declared her intentions to the senior figures who came to swear allegiance to her. This quote given by Elizabeth seems to have become famous. My lords, the law of nature moves me to sorrow for my sister. The burden that is fallen upon me makes me amazed. And yet, considering I am God's creature, ordained to obey his appointment, I will thereto yield, desiring from the bottom of my heart that I may have assistance of his grace to be the minister of his heavenly will in this office now committed to me. And as I am but one body naturally considered, though by his permission a body politic to govern. This reflected common views of the age, that a monarch had two bodies, a body natural, their own, and a body politic, a divinely appointed self who was destined to rule. Elizabeth was immediately welcomed by the population. They were tired of the brutal and divisive rule of Mary, under which many people had been executed in particularly brutal and sadistic ways. Many were afraid of the marriage question, the idea of who Elizabeth would marry and what effect this would have on England, and also of the Catholic threat. There were still many Catholics in England, and violence between them and Protestants seemed likely. Depictions of Elizabeth at a young age, as with any important figure, vary wildly. Mostly, however, especially as a child, she was described warmly, especially by her tutors. Her very first governess, responsible for her education, and someone who would have, would have spent a lot of time with Elizabeth, described her thusly, as toward a child and gentle of condition as ever I knew any in my life, which was high praise. Elizabeth was widely applauded for her education. The Venetian ambassador wrote that she possessed these languages so thoroughly that each appeared to be her native tongue, indicating that Elizabeth spoke a variety of languages, French and Latin, for example, so well she was fluent and potentially able to persuade important people native to that tongue that she was indeed herself a native speaker. An education of this level and fluency, especially among girls, would have been unusual for the time. In her younger years, Elizabeth had a range of suitors, people wanting to marry her. Most of these were much older than her who wanted to marry her, for example, for political reasons or for power. Putting together these depictions, however, we can put together a picture. Elizabeth was clearly intelligent, well-read, stubborn and headstrong, qualities that would become even more apparent as her reign as queen continued. The long reign of Elizabeth I is generally viewed positively by historians. Most contemporary and later views on Elizabeth see her as a strong and reasoned ruler who ruled with logic and reason to act in the national interest. She was much less disposed to brutal executions, especially by sadistic methods, than her predecessors had been, and did not seem to view them as a way to impose her authority. However, as one may expect, there are dissenting views from this. Some historians, although a minority, have viewed her as short-tempered and indecisive, which led to a decline in popularity at the end of her reign, or judgment, began to run out. Depictions from the time of Elizabeth's reign are almost always positive. However, these are not reliable, as this would be expected. Writing negatively in public of the monarch was treasonable, and even in private, if the documents were found, was likely to lead to imprisonment or even execution. What is certain, however, is that after a long period of instability with Henry VIII and then Mary, Elizabeth ruled for 44 years. This brought to England a very welcome time of stability, where culture, science and society began to progress rapidly. This period from 1558 to 1602 is known as the Elizabethan Age or the First Elizabethan Age. Elizabeth would, however, be the last Tudor monarch. Her successor was James VI of Scotland, who would become James I in England and this would begin the Jacobean Age. Ow! 
ouch. This is why in some videos I have unexplained scratches.